Welcome to the baccalaureate for the class of 1997. If you could all stand, Reverend Michael Hickox of the New England Conference United Methodist Church will give the invocation. To the class of 1997, you are surrounded by such love and appreciation tonight. I hope you are basking in it, appreciate it, and will remember it always. This class is surrounded by family, parents, grandparents, siblings, and others who care and love, appreciate them. If we could, we would call together others who are of our society, who are there for these people, who form the fabric of the society into which they go. If we could call those who had come before us to stand around and surround us, we could call Amos and Micah, Hosea and Isaiah, Hebrew prophets, voices of the oppressed to come and stand around them. Jesus of Nazareth, Prince of Peace, to stand here beside them. Francis, follower of Jesus and friend of creatures, all to stand beside them. Those of other cultures, the Buddha, enlightened and compassionate one to bring compassion surrounding us. Gandhi the Mahatma, liberator of India, to bring caring and surround us. Martin Luther King, preacher of nonviolence, to lead us in ways of nonviolence. Dorothy Day, friend of the poor, to bring caring. And those of today, educators, scientists, bakers of bread, shift workers, small salespeople, politicians, astronauts, dancers, and ball players, all who form the fabric of our society and of our lives. We call them to stand around you, class of 1997, to be with us today to honor this class and to eagerly await their contribution to our world. Please be seated. For those of you in the back, there are some seats at the front and in the middle uh, if you'd like to settle in. Tonight we come together to celebrate the achievements of our lower, middle, and upper school students and to share in the baccalaureate service the special talents and memories of the class of 1997. Before starting, I want to uh, thank uh, several people who in quiet and constant ways make graduation such a special time at Berwick Academy. Uh, to Laura Adams, uh, who has worked for a year to try to retire from this place, uh, and each time she gets to graduation, she knows I can't do this by myself, and so she hangs on. Uh, to Mike, Richie, and Paul, who have uh, fought the elements of this strange spring, or lack of spring, to make the campus look as good as it does. To Polly Davy, or as I now understand she is honorably titled, Ma, uh, the advisor for the class of 1997. To John Davy for again setting up the senior run, and for then goading us into setting a new record for laps. Uh, that's bad news to some of the, you trustees back there who supported that. Uh, to Brad Fletcher and that magic uh, senior trivia uh, contest and all the wonderful memories that evoked. And to our musicians, a special thanks. Uh, one of their number is not with us tonight, so that was a, uh, uh, an improvisation as well as a lot of talent. Uh, thank you very much for tonight. It's now my pleasure to start with the lower school and introduce Ruth Rio, who is our Dean of Faculty and also the Director of the lower school, uh, to start the awards presentations. Ruth? We have three lower school awards tonight. The first award is for composition. Since my first day on campus eight years ago, I have been aware of the strong writing tradition at Berwick. At Lower School, we support this tradition through our Young Authors Day, our Visiting Authors Program, our Summer Writing Program, and our daily writing requirements, both in the writing class itself and also in all other disciplines. Since his arrival in first grade, we knew that this year's recipient had a rare gift, 
I don't believe that I was premature when after his first grade year, I sent his mother a list of publishers of children's writings. He displays a rare fluency with not only language, but with creative ideas and opinions. It is my pleasure to award this year's Composition Award to Ben DeVries. When we begin to consider candidates for the Lower School Math Award, we seek a student who not only exhibits excellent computational skills, but who also has strong creative problem-solving abilities, as well as outstanding inductive and de deductive reasoning skills. This year's award winner certainly shows evidence of all of those qualities. Additionally, she offers an intensity and an enthusiasm that is unmatched in her peer group. The Math Award recipient this year is Elizabeth Lutz. <laughs> Elizabeth is unable to be here tonight. She's not feeling well, but we honor her in her absence. The final lower school award is for citizenship. And the Citizenship Award, award honors the fourth grade student who has been the behavioral role model for their class. This year's award winner has a sparkle and a joy that colors all of her interactions at school. She's been able to master the remarkable trick of absolute inclusion, both emotionally and literally, at the same time that she's able to maintain and convey an individual identity and independence from the group. I am pleased to name Nina Morenci Broussard as this year's Citizenship Award winner. I now would like to call Ms. Good and Mrs. Harrington up to award the Big Brother Award. Grader at Berwick is being given the opportunity to have a member of the senior class act as a big brother or sister for a year. Some of the first graders are fortunate enough to know their big brother or sister for two years, beginning in the kindergarten year. This year, the students participated in such activities as reading books or drawing pictures together, playing games on the computer, and sitting together at all school assemblies. We would like to recognize all of the seniors who participated in the Big Brother Big Sister program, including Darcy Hagen and Sarah Parkinson who directed the program this year. So would all participants please stand? At this time, we'd like to ask first graders Heather Binney and Allison Brown to come forward to help us present the award. This year's award goes to a senior who showed exceptional dedication to his two first graders. He went out of his way to find the children on campus, always greeting them with a huge smile and a hug. He often stopped by the first grade classrooms just to say hi and never failed to make these two children feel special. This year's award goes to Joey Myers. Mr. Witherby, the director of the middle school, will present the middle school awards and the Cogswell prizes uh, for the middle school. Mr. Witherby. Each spring as we get together as a middle school faculty to discuss the middle school awards and uh, come up with winners for the awards, it's a truly joyous time for us as a faculty. The middle school awards are awarded each year to the middle schooler at each grade level to recognize citizenship,
contributions to the school and fellow students, and academic excellence. As a student moves into the middle school, he or she is asked to engage in many diverse areas of school life, sometimes in areas that are not necessarily that student's favorite thing to do. The greatest quality of fifth grader Stephen Andelman is his unbridled enthusiasm. The motivation to embrace every challenge is intrinsically a part of Stephen. I am very proud to award Stephen Andelman the fifth grade middle school award. Stephen had to leave a baseball game to get here, and apparently they're losing in the uh, fourth inning. <laughs> Sixth grader Ashley St. Pierre is a new student at Berwick this year. She has had an immediate positive impact on our school. In her unselfish, generous, unassuming way, Ashley in instinctively finds the positive side of every situation within which she comes into contact. I am very proud to honor Ashley St. Pierre as our sixth grade middle school award winner. <laughs> Seventh grader Erica Ramsey has won this award before as a fifth grader. When we vote, get together as a faculty to discuss this award, we sometimes will take that into account. But with someone like Erica, her strengths are too obvious to ignore. She has a level of competence, talent, and insightfulness well beyond her years. In her supportive, outgoing manner, and as a young woman of superlative values, she is an active leader of her peers. We are again proud to honor Erica Ramsey as a seventh grade middle school award recipient. Actually, she and her family are off at a horse show this weekend. Where Erica is an active leader of her peers, eighth grader Matthew Weingartner is just as strong a leader, but a different type. He leads by example. That example is of a caring, confident citizen upon whom the entire middle school community has the utmost trust and respect. Matt clearly has the values and judgment of the highest level. We are proud to honor Matt Weingartner as the eighth grade recipient of the Middle School Award. The William Lambert Cogswell Prize books are presented each year to the Academy's ranking scholars. In the fifth grade, Christine O'Brien is an extremely talented student who has shown her gifted nature throughout the year. I am proud to honor the Cogswell Prize as the fifth grade ranking scholar to Christine O'Brien. This horse show thing is going to get in the way. The seventh, uh, excuse me, the sixth grade Cogswell Prize winner is Caitlin Ramsey. I had the honor of seeing firsthand in class this year the spirit, motivation, and true talent which make Caitlin Ramsey the incredible, consistent student that she is. In her absence, we are proud to honor Caitlin Ramsey as the sixth grade Cogswell Prize winner. In the seventh grade, we have a three-peat winner. Christina Massey has won the award as a fifth, sixth, and now a seventh grader. She has not only been able to be the ranking scholar in the seventh grade, but she's attained that rank while still surviving Mr. Newman's eighth grade Algebra I class. She is a great spirit, and we are proud to honor her as the, uh, <laughs> as the winner for the seventh grade Cogswell Prize. Christina.
In the eighth grade, we have another three-peat winner. Anna Yurchison is winning as the eighth grader and as our fourth young woman to win the Cogswell Prize in the middle school. According to her teachers, Anna has reached a new level this year of academic achievement. Her ability to synthesize information is far beyond her years. We will miss Anna next year, but for tonight, we are proud to honor her as our Cogswell winner. Anna. I'm now happy to turn the program over to Peter Gilmore, the director of the upper school, to continue with the Cogswell Awards and with the other uh, upper school awards. Mr. Gilmore. Each year at the end of the year, uh, I have to steal a little bit of mic time to say some words because I am a notable omission from the uh, regular line of speakers at the end of the year. Um, I am certainly an omission notable, that's up to you. <laughs> um, I, I want to say just a couple things uh, before I get on with the Cogswell Awards. Uh, first of all, we have here this evening a uh, distinguished member of our faculty who has been with Berwick Academy for an awful long time. Uh, and I was very fortunate to find out just today uh, that this member of our faculty has in fact been teaching at uh, secondary level in uh, independent schools in New England uh, for 35 years. And I'd like us all to give a very warm congratulations on completion of 35 years to Bob Hawks. That round of applause, of course, is extremely nice of all of us, but uh, we all should take a moment uh, at some point this evening or this weekend uh, to express our gratitudes to it, towards uh, Bob Hawks for giving so much of his time and effort and of his life to teaching, and especially here at Burke Academy. Um, we also, uh, this evening, uh, came up with a new event uh, in the end of the year. Uh, Today was the first time at 5.30 this evening we had a banquet for the seniors. And uh, it was really beautiful because people shared uh, some talents as well as uh, some heartfelt thoughts about the seniors and about the faculty from the seniors. Uh, it turned out to be uh, far better than any of the planners expected. It was a very warm and, uh, and I think uh, cherished event for the first time to offer it. Um, I, at that event, I thanked a lot of people, but I failed to thank the one person whose idea uh, that event was. And I will uh, do my best impression of uh, Mr. Fletcher, uh, if you will bear with me. When he came up with the idea, we were sitting around talking about it, and he said, I would love to present something in the form of a banquet. And only Mr. Fletcher can certainly put that type of accent on that, uh, and I'm glad I loved it too, Brad, so <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, uh, the Cogswell Awards are for the ranking scholar in the upper school uh, on each of the years. And uh, I would please ask all of the award winners uh, from this point on to please come up on this side of the stage so that we can, you know, the photographer's shaking his head, yes, uh, over here so that we can get a good picture of you because you really don't want pictures of me uh, too much in your... Uh, pictures of sons and daughters. So if you come up over this side and if award presenters will step out to this side, uh, I think we can get a good shot. The Cogswell Award uh, in the freshman class is given to the student uh, who is the ranking scholar and I can tell you that this was an extremely close uh, call. However, uh, there, there are a, a real strong group of students who were competing uh, and it came down to the smallest margin. However, this uh, student did prevail, and she prevailed uh, certainly through a tremendous amount of effort 
uh, a great adjustment as she's a new student here at Berwick this year. And I'm very pleased and, and proud to give the Cogswell Award for the freshman class to Melissa Smith. <laughs> that will go in absentia. Uh, the Cogswell Award for the sophomore class, ranking scholar, please uh, congratulate an extremely hardworking young man who I had the privi uh, privilege of teaching last year, and all of the sophomore teachers will agree had the privilege of teaching this year, and I know that the junior teachers will agree uh, will have the privilege of teaching next year, and that is Kevin Paul. The Cogswell Award winner for the Ranking Scholar from the junior class is no uh, new person to this award. He is a scholar in the uh, finest sense of the word. He will be, I'm sure, uh, not surprised, but neither n we are all not surprised either, uh, that he has once again prevailed in this capacity. He is a tireless worker. He is a brilliant thinker, a tremendous uh, student in all areas. I used to think that English was his weak point, not any longer. He seems to have really learned an awful lot here uh, in his weaknesses as well as his strengths. And I'm very happy to give the, award, the Cogswell Award uh, for the ranking scholar in the junior class to Brandon McKenna. The awards uh, that come at this point are the honor awards. They're given by the various departments in the upper school uh, for students who have excelled in those particular areas. I will introduce the first honor award uh, uh, presenter, uh, the uh, member of the English department, head of the English department, Ted Sherbon, and then can all of the other uh, faculty who are uh, awarding in order just proceed up here and, uh, and give the awards. Ted Sherbon will be giving it in English, Zan Melhorn in mathematics, Susan Maddock in computer science, Jennifer St. Martin in biology, Rebecca Borden in chemistry, Razel Kahlberg in physics, Brad Fletcher in history, Dana Clinton in French, John Downey in Latin, Lynn Gass in Spanish, Susanna White in art, Nathan Amstead in applied music, Nathan Amstead in music, and Valerie Cookson in dance. So, uh, Mr. Sherbon. The Senior Honor English Award goes to a student who for several years now has been an intellectual leader in the classroom and in his writing. I taught this young man last year and echo all of his, I, and echo all his teacher of this year has to say that this young man helps set the intellectual tone for his class and his peers often look to him to get things started or to provide the synthesis at the end of discussions, that he always shoots high on his papers, choosing the most ambitious topics that inevitably require the most work, that his intellectual curiosity at times drives him literally up out of his chair to work out a point that he truly has come to use language and the essay as his primary tool for understanding the world of ideas around him. We present this award to Tim Montminy. Thank you. Three years ago, Mr. Hett stood here to present this award to a graduating senior who was the first student in, the, in Burt Academy's history to complete the BC Calculus AP course. Last year, that course was offered for just the second time in the Academy's history. That class included two seniors and one junior, Kristen Anderson. Tomorrow, Kristen will receive her diploma as the only student in the 206th year history of this institution who has not only completed all of the prerequisite calculus courses to earn a math major in college, 
but also started to study an advanced course in probability. Kristen has pushed herself and her teachers very hard during the past four years. I have had the honor of working with her during the last two years. What has distinguished Kristen is her intuitive understanding of even the most complex mathematical problems. I rarely had the opportunity to construct a grammatically complete sentence before Kristen would interrupt with an analogy or an observation that I considered to be two or three steps ahead of where we were. I became so accustomed to her acuity that I gave up trying to construct complete sentences and moved on to half thoughts and gestures. <laughs> what was truly amazing was that Kristen not only understood, she still beat me to the end of the problems. When she visited Colgate this spring, Kristen sat in on one of the, cl on the closing minutes of a third semester calculus class. Afterwards, she approached the professor to discuss a double integration technique with which she was not familiar. Fortunately for me, it was a technique that the professor considered uniquely his own. But I'm quite certain that Kristen's knowledge, maturity, and confidence were duly noted, and I'm willing to bet that there is at least one professor at Colgate ready to recruit Kristen to be a math major. Kristen, I am glad you intend to continue your study of mathematics through your undergraduate years. Maybe you will retire from the law to teach math one day. It brings me great pleasure to present you with the Mathematics Honor Award this evening. Best of luck and congratulations on your four extremely successful record smashing years here at the I'm delighted to present an award for excellence in computer science this evening. All of us have fought with computers. Sometimes we've won, and sometimes they have. How many times have we wished that they could interpret what we mean, rather than literally executing what we say? Excellence in programming requires a person to work with precision, where a misplaced comma can cause the computer to refuse to operate. Programming requires that a project be dissected thoroughly so that every piece of it is understood completely and can be translated into a set of directions. Not surprisingly, the order of the directions is critical. Whereas a comma, a syntax error, can cause a program to stop, a misplaced end if statement, a logic error, can cause the computer to head off into never, never land, happily doing something someplace in its memory. One might ask, why do programmers put up with this? The complex answer is because it's pure problem solving. It crosses all disciplines, utilizing the creativity of an artist, the meticulousness of a mathematician, and the logical flow of a writer. The simple answer is that because programming is fun. The recipient of tonight's award is a student who has demonstrated a long-term commitment to computer science in his coursework here and in his future college work. I first taught him when he was a sophomore, and since then, his work has been an odyssey from adventure games to battleship, from introductory work to advanced placement concepts. Most recently, he tackled Java for his senior project. Throughout all of Alex Reed's work runs the creativity and thoroughness, the logic and attentiveness to detail that are the mark of excellence. For this, I would like to honor Alex for his work in computer science. of the Biology Award this year is a junior whose intellectual curiosity and questioning mind place her far, be, uh, uh, far above her peers in terms of her abilities and insights. An active participant in class and a leader in laboratory investigations, this young woman is going to go very far in the sciences. Her ability to relate material to the world around her is exemplary, and for this reason it is my honor to present the Award for Excellence in Biology to Ms. Shannon Kearns. The 
may surprise many of you to learn that diamonds are chemically unstable. However, spontaneity says nothing about the rate of a reaction. If you were to view tonight's recipient as a chemical reaction, his consumption of chemistry can only can be considered spontaneous and fast. He is a never-ending reaction that releases more energy than he takes in. But Kevin Paul's reaction rate in chemistry goes well beyond traditional descriptions. In lab, chemistry, Kevin was able to infer experimental procedures that were months ahead in the curriculum. From questions on the recent MacGyver rerun episode to a poster on brain diagnosing tools, Kevin has inspired me by his talent to relate chemical topics to the world around him. Thank you for a wonderful year and great success in biology next year, Kevin. Is light a wave? Certainly it has many behaviors which suggest it is, but it also has some behaviors which are more easily explained if we consider it to be made of particles. Is an electron a particle? Well, yes, but it also has some behaviors which are more easily explained if we consider it a wave. Is this confusing? Perhaps. But perhaps someone with intelligence, creativity, humor, and a driving need to know will formulate a better theory. Brandon McKenna is such a person. He has all these traits and has exhibited them throughout the year, both in and out of the physics classroom. I am honored and pleased to present him with this year's physics award. Every teacher who uh, stays around for a while knows that over the long haul of the year, you have to feed off the energy and the enthusiasm of your students. And I'm lucky enough that I have whole classes that I can tap that way. Uh, senior electives this year on the 1960s, scientists as humanists, and most especially in the spring, the humanities. But while I can tap the entire class, there's one individual in particular over all three of those electives uh, from whom I drew enough of her effervescent energy, her sparkling curiosity, and her great good humor to last a grateful lifetime. She is, and always will be, the in inimitable Kate Bovere. Messieurs, Mesdames, Mesdemoiselles, Bonsoir. One student to receive an award for outstanding work in French. From many exceptional talents, intense workers, and obvious amateurs de français, true lovers of French. How delightful for me to have to make a choice so difficult. Yet I will say that this young woman has made the most noticeable growth I've ever seen between freshman and senior years glowed in all the work she did and maintained total dedication to individual and class work through the very final project of the year. It is my great pleasure to bestow the 1997 award in French to Reagan Campbell. I've been fortunate to have had Kristen Anderson as a Latin student for six years. Since 1991, both she and I have been on a journey, a journey to learn, understand, and appreciate the Latin language, and that we have done. I've been at Berwick for 11 years, and during that time I've been gifted, I've never been gifted with a student comparable to Kristen. She's not only learned the ability to translate, but also to interpret the thoughts of classical authors better than any student I have ever taught. She has a true talent. I recently spoke with some of my fellow classicists to get their input of Kristen's work. Here are some of their thoughts. Ovid thought, you're going to get this, right? Materiam superabat opus. 
Translation, the worksmanship was better than the subject matter. Manlius thought, Perwarius usus artem experientia fecit. Through different exercises, practice has brought skill. Horace replied, Nec verbum verbo curiabas redirit idus interpres. As a true translator, you will take care not to translate word for word. Cicero himself said, In virtute sunt multi ascensus. In excellence, there are many degrees. And as wise as he was, Ovid captured it all by saying, Redent stolidi verba latina. Only fools laugh at the Latin language. <laughs> Kristen, I congratulate you for earning this award, for having endured dealing with me for every day for six years, and for, for bringing beauty to the language that most have let slip back into time. I'm very proud of you. Pax Wobiscum. Buenas noches. I am very glad that I don't have to miss tonight's ceremonies. I did last year, and it hurt the whole time I was away. I don't have to leave till next week. Um, I've always been very proud of my winners, but this year I'm particularly proud. Um, many words of praise have been showered on this young man already, including many of my own, but I'll just add a few new ones. Or maybe they're not new. They've probably been said already. Brilliance, kindness, unrelenting motivation, dedication. This young man has reached the ability to be able to, to argue highly intense topics in Spanish. Many of these discussions stem from articles he happens to have read. As he himself said tonight at the banquet, he happened to read an article that was about David Halberstam and it caused a whole bunch of inspiration, inspiration for him. He was always borrowing my magazines. Just this week, uh, last week when he was doing senior projects, he wanted something else to do in case he had some spare time. So he borrowed a magazine, and Wednesday night at the run, he said to me in Spanish in the buffet line, talk to me about the uh, article that he read about immigration. I wasn't quite prepared to have a Spanish discussion, but he was. <laughs> um, I'm going to give him this new magazine, which just happened to have come today, because he will certainly get to read it before I will. It gives me much pleasure to give this year's award to Santiago Reggie Toussaint. It is my pleasure this evening to honor this year's Art Honors Award recipient. I've worked closely with this student over the past nine months and have been highly impressed by her creativity, her intelligence, her motivation, her courage, her modesty, and by her commitment to excellence in all of her artwork. Over the course of the year, she has taken two art independent studies and maintained a hundred average. In the fall, she scaled 25 foot high scaffolding to paint 18 replacement windows in our faculty lounge, which she designed in one night and painted in under three weeks. Her behind the scenes involvement in West Side Story was instrumental to the success of the show. This spring, she learned some valuable lessons about art and politics when her work pushed the boundaries of social norms. Rather than modifying her ideas or giving up, she sought an alternative and ultimately better solution. Indeed, she seems to innately understand Martha Graham's words of wisdom to Agnes DeMille. There's a vitality, a life force, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because of you in all time, this expression is unique. If you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and be lost. The world will not have it. Elizabeth Nezher. It is my honor to bestow upon you the Art Honors Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Visual Arts. You are a fine honor art, artist excuse me, and an inspiration to all of us. I am humbled by your artistic sensibility and am proud to have been your teacher this year. Congratulations.
the recipient of the Applied Music Award, someone whose appetite for music would rival a T-Rex in Jurassic Park. He's torn hungrily into whatever has been within reach, spitting out what is unchewable, and straining everything else through the six strings of his guitar. His additional studies of piano, saxophone, theory, and an independent study of jazz arranging and improvisation were capped by a senior project in the recording studio. His passion and excitement for learning music have brightened the Arts Center on many a day this past long, dreary winter. And one might easily wonder how someone could display so much positive energy when he spends so much time playing the blues. Our congratulations to a fine musician and an even finer person, Mr. Rob Beyer. Ms. Sarah McNamee has been a central part of vocal music in all her years at Burke Academy. Through ac academic pursuits, the theater, and the many concerts the Academy sponsors, Sarah has shown a quiet power and a dignity that has blessed the performing arts. Her dedication to music was ever so more evident at her own senior recital, where her intellect and artistry were woven together and painted with the true colors of human emotion. It created a down comforter that just spread out over the audience. Her quiet inspiration to other vocalists is a legacy that will bear fruit in the school community for many years to come. On behalf of the faculty, many thanks, many congratulations for this award, and best of luck in the future, Sarah. Kim Brandt, this year's recipient of the Honor Award in Dance, has been a student of dance both here at Berwick Academy and in her community. I was first introduced to Kim Brandt last year in our Company Blue choreography class. I was thrilled to see and hear the complex syncopated rhythms that this beginning tap dancer was assembling. This year, as Kim continued her quest for swinging feet, she shared her tapping talents with Berwick Academy it, the Winterfest in her solo, Sing, Sing, Sing. Kim embraces diversity in style in her dancing, which is the most important thing in dancers today. Kim presents a striking work, Kim presented her striking work of modern choreography for the dance concert this May. And in demonstration of her directing skills, Kim choreographed and rehearsed the Jets and Shark Girls as their dance captain for West Side Story. It is with great respect and hope for the future of dance that I present this award to Kim Brandt. The next awards, I will introduce each of the faculty who will be giving them out. Uh, the first award is the Perkins Prize, and it's one of those awards with a lot of criteria on it. This year, once again, we will not be giving out the Gilmore Prize for handsome, good-looking, sensitive 90 males over six foot five. <laughs> Nobody seems to fulfill those requirements up there. Okay. Jason Perrin was close. Uh, The Perkins Prize uh, this evening will be given out by Brad Fletcher. Uh, as uh, Mr. Gilmore uh, pointed out, this is one of those awards that comes with uh, kind of a, a, a laundry list of criteria. It has to be a main student who has been at the academy uh, two years or more, and the ranking scholar in history and English. Uh, Mr. Sherban uh, also uh, generally 
uh, likes to tie it to the top of Mount Agamenicus. You have to live within 30 air miles of the summit. Um, and he and I get together and sort of scratch our heads, and uh, we do find one little loophole in there that allows us to sort of play with this a little bit, and that is that there is almost never one person who is the ranking scholar in both, both history and English, although sometimes we are splitting the finest of hairs uh, on this. So we, are, uh, we find ourselves able to add our own criteria, and although the Perkins uh, award doesn't actually require that you be a quietly serious person of constant good cheer and overall nice to everyone and small animals, it, it helps. <laughs> and even then, we usually find year in, year out that choosing that individual can be a problem, except this year, uh, because it can be a problem unless you happen to have Katie Rushlow in your class. So Katie Rushlow. <laughs> prize and it will be given out by Ted Sherbon. Thank you. I should note that uh, when Brad and I get together and scratch our heads, it is indeed a uh, splitting of hairs. <laughs> Very fine hairs, he said. The Kelleher Prize is the result of an in-class essay competition judged by all members of the English department. The competition is open to all juniors, and the question, different each year, covers all of the material from the junior year and asks students to examine a major theme back through the history of American literature. This year's winner wrote a detailed and persuasive essay linking Walden, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and The Great Gatsby through their various depictions of the pursuit of the Puritan New Jerusalem. The award goes to Brandon McKenna. And that will be given out by Bob Ox. A couple of things. First of all, to Mr. Gilmore about those kind of uh, words earlier. Uh, I had to ask around to find out if I was retiring. <laughs> Secondly, uh, this is the Class of 1915 award, and believe it or not, it was not the year that I was born. Uh, Mr. Dean was born then, but not me. <laughs> This award is chosen by the English and math departments and presented to a student who has excelled at both. Four years ago, this young lady drew immediate attention for her excellence in these areas and other areas as well. She has received numerous departmental recognition awards, twice in English and once in math, in the short time that this award has been in existence. Her other awards, even prior to this evening, are too numerous to mention. Abby Rose is an outstanding student in both English and math, and it is a privilege to present her with this award. The next award is the Pars Parson Thompson Award. The Parson Thompson Award is named for one of Verwick's founders. It recognizes seniors who have contributed to the lives of others off the hilltop. Uh, this year, two seniors have done exactly that, but not this just this year. Uh, they have done it for four years here. These two students have given of themselves in any number of uh, different drives to help uh, underprivileged uh, members of our society outside of Berwick. Uh, just this year, uh, Joe Myers continued his single uh, effort to uh, raise uh, clothing for local Indian tribes, as well as uh, he did a fine job on the scholarship uh, for Jake Strattard, uh, one of the workers uh, who fell from the scaffolding 
uh, earlier this year. But those are just two tiny parts of what he has done here. He has given uh, a great deal to people outside of Berwick in our name. Darcy Hagan has also for four years given a tremendous amount uh, to people outside of Berwick. She's a regular organizer of various uh, service drives. She participated in a big way in the elderly program and in the blood drives that we've had here. And as I say once again, these are only small amounts of uh, what these people have done. The altruism that they express is a tremendous plus for us as a community and as a school out in the world beyond these walls. And we appreciate so much the work that they have done. So congratulations to Joe Myers and Darcy Hagan. At this time in our ceremony, uh, we tend to take a moment to recognize scholars in the senior class uh, who have been inducted into the Cum Laude Society, which is the uh, honor society for independent schools. I would like each of these people to stand. There are a number of them in this class, and I hope that I don't miss any of them. But can the following seniors please stand in recognition of their in inductions into the Cum Laude Society? Abby Rose, Tim Montminy, Sarah Parkinson, Nick Orsillo, Reggie Toussaint, and Christian Anderson. Also at this time, uh, there is a, an award that has been given as a special award this year because uh, its uh, recipient happens to be a member of our senior class. I am quite sure that this is a sought after award in Kennebunk and it is the Kennebunk Mothers Club Award and it happens to go uh, this evening to uh, one of our seniors who's, uh, who lives obviously in Kennebunk and whose mother is also part of that organization. And we would, uh, it's a scholarship and we're very happy this evening to give this award to Alex Reed. <laughs> now I'd like to ask Dan Raposa to come forward to hand out the Hilltop Awards. Before I present the Hilltop Awards, recognizing the outstanding athletes in the 8th and 12th grades, I just wanted to take a minute and recognize an individual coach here at the Academy. Last Thursday evening, we didn't have this information in, but many of you are probably aware that we were able to share the Kozlowski Athletic Center this spring with our Eastern Independent League opponents as we hosted the EIL Tennis Championships. And on Tuesday of this week, I was told that uh, Coach Ted Sherbon, our tennis coach at the varsity level, received the EIL Coach of the Year Award. Coach Sherbon, we congratulate you. Well done. The other recognition I want to uh, bring to your attention happened here on Thursday evening. The class of 97 happens to be made up of many outstanding student athletes, seven of them in particular I'd like to ask to please stand. Sarah, Tom, Chris, Peter, Joe, Jason, and Brett. Would you please stand? These, these, seven, these seven student athletes each committed 12 seasons of athletic participation here at the Academy. They become the uh, largest group to be inducted into the Terry Doggett Bulldog Club and we here are very proud and certainly thankful of their efforts on the fields, in the gymnasiums, ice rinks here at the Academy. Well done. Our Hilltop Awards are presented each year to two members of the eighth grade class and two members of the senior class. 
And the inscription on the plaque in the Kozlowski Center reads in part that the Hilltop Awards are presented for outstanding athletic skills and achievements. I was recently with a good friend of mine and talked a great deal with him about what really truly makes one an outstanding athlete. And he is a career coach and I have a tremendous respect and admiration for what he has done over his career because he's coached many outstanding athletes. And the one quality that really I think helps define the difference between a very good athlete and truly outstanding athlete is the fact that the outstanding athlete makes everyone around him and her better than they actually are. And I think that the four recipients of the Hilltop Award certainly made all of their teammates here at the Academy better. I'm very pleased to present the Middle School Hilltop Awards to the team of Jonathan Williams and Francis Sewell. Our duo from this class of 97 behind me caused us uh, a little bit of difficulty as we went through the selection process. Clearly, our outstanding female athlete uh, was easy to pick. She is the one female student athlete who was inducted into our Bulldog Club. She participated in the soccer, basketball, ice hockey, and lacrosse programs. Our male athlete in the senior class was much more difficult to select. There's clearly a group behind me on this stage that are worthy of this honor. But we did select one, and his coach defined his ability and his achievement by the simple word presence. I am very proud to present the Hilltop Awards to Sarah Parkinson and Tom Biatti. The Blue and White Awards is presented annually to the underclassman who, in the eyes of the faculty, has contributed most to the academy. This year, uh, of the junior class where we usually choose from, there were a number of students whose names were brought forth. It's a tremendous uh, tribute to all of those members of the junior class who have given so much over the years. Although hard-pressed, we did choose two uh, to receive the award this evening. Shannon Kearns is a young woman who, if I had to sum it up, uh, gives energy uh, to this school. She gives many things as far as her abilities in leadership, in, uh, in classroom work. In fact, she has received more departmental recognition awards than any student here and uh, she is very much recognized by, her, uh, by the faculty here and by her peers as a, a young woman who gives all that she has uh, to, and all the effort she has to this school. And I'm very happy uh, tonight to give that award, the Blue and White Award, to Shannon Kearns. The other woman in the junior class gives in a very different way. Uh, this is a young woman who, if you have ever seen her play in any of her primary sports, I would have to use the word heart to sum up what she gives to this school. To watch her is uh, watching someone give everything she has in every athletic encounter. Um, the great thing is that Tori Davey gives even beyond uh, the athletic field as well into many areas of school. If I had to choose two students who were models uh, for Berwick students here at the, uh, at the Academy, clearly these two names would rise uh, to the surface. And I'm very happy this evening uh, to give the Blue and White Awards to Shannon Kearns and Tori Davey.
I'm sorry, uh, just uh, off the program a little bit here. Um, the Douglas Dara Hollis Award will be given out by Mrs. Kahlberg. I, I apologize, Ms. Kahlberg. The Douglas, the Douglas Dara Hollis Memorial Award is an award for achievements and growth in the dramatic arts. And I have the honor of presenting that award tonight to a woman who has graced our stage many times with her dancing, acting, and singing. Mary Elizabeth Hanna has been involved with the performing arts in and out of Berwick Academy for many years. Her credits are numerous. My personal involvement with her has spanned five upper school musicals. Yes, I did say five. She played a child in Carousel when she was in sixth grade and went on while she was in the upper school to participate in Damn Yankees, Guys and Dolls, South Pacific, and West Side Story. No one who saw her in the role of Ensign Nellie Forbush in South Pacific, singing, dancing, and at least trying to wash that man right out of her hair, will ever forget her. And no one who knows her will ever forget what a trooper she showed herself to be this year. Congratulations, Mary Liz. Best wishes for the future. I'm uh, departing from the program uh, briefly, uh, but I want to thank two members of the class of 1997 who have been Berwick students since the beginning. Uh, we will hear from these lifers in a few moments, uh, but for right now, I would like to offer them histories of the Academy, Mike Merrigy and Ryan Wong. And in another uh, diversion, I would like to recognize five families. And it's hard to describe this, but they are five families who are finishing their Berwick careers with a second or a third child. Sue and Dave Yaddy have seen Jen and now Tom through the academy. Peter is the third for Linda and Jack Clark after Sean and Katie. Joe and Linda Hagen started with Poppy and are finishing with Darcy. Elaine and Jerry Merrigy started with Chris and are finishing with Mike. And Cindy and Joe Myers have seen Jim through and are finishing with Joey. I dare anyone in this room to count the recitals, the concerts, <laughs> the miles commuted, the dollars spent, the counsel offered of this group. Uh, I thank you all very much uh, and thank all parents in their stead. Thank you. The Headmaster's Award recognizes uh, a member or members of the senior class who best typify the ideals and spirit of the Academy. It is my pleasure to award this to two seniors this year. Joe Myers, who took us at our word when we asked him to make a difference and went on to honor the Academy with his incredible, incredible enthusiasm. Joe. And Reggie Toussaint, who took us at our word when we asked him to explore the life of the mind. And he went on to honor and grace our classroom with genuine intellectual curiosity. Reggie. As we conclude this recognition of the accomplishments of our students, it's more than merely appropriate that we recognize and thank the faculty who are leaving us this year. Their gifts certainly live in the achievements of their students. Joan Roulard brought our library from the 19th century to the 21st century 
in her tenure with us. She honored the tradition of the former and she brought the potential of the latter. Joan also managed to stretch her time in the library's resources, and only Joan knows what that means, to serve the learning needs of our lower, middle, and upper school students. Heather Bryce brought a wonderful enthusiasm for a learning and appreciation of young people together to invigorate the lower school French program. Joan is heading east to Great Britain, and Heather is heading west to California, I believe. I hope they will both take our gratitude with them. Thanks very much. And finally, last year we inaugurated uh, the Outstanding Teaching Award, named for Dorothy Green, the valedictorian of the class of 1925, a Berwick teacher for many years, still active tutoring students in Latin and correcting the headmaster's writing errors. Knowing this faculty as well as all in this room do, it is clear that the selection of a single person for outstanding teaching is beyond ordinary presumption. Nonetheless, that was a charge to the administrative group. This year's selection is a person who honors our profession and our school with her care and respect for her students and their different learning needs and potentials, with her commitment to learning as well as teaching, and with her willingness to do the extra things to teach better and to make a better school. The Academy is very fortunate that Wendy Harrington has accepted the responsibility for helping all of us, students and teachers, in bringing the technological potentials of the 21st century into our classrooms. It gives me great pleasure to award Wendy the Dorothy Green Outstanding Teaching Award. This concludes the awards presentations and we now move to the class of 1997's baccalaureate program. I can tell you from the dinner program we had earlier that it is bound to be great. Uh, there may be uh, a little more humor uh, than you might imagine after this long an evening, but maybe we need it. The upper school chorus will open the program. Mr. Fletcher will uh, continue with the faculty presentation and then the members of the class of 1997 will complete the program. Uh, if you take, if you'll hold just a minute, we'll get the stage assembled. Thank you.
I do, I should just say, I think it's uh, probably immediately apparent to you that in those meetings with Mr. Sherbon, I merely play along with his pathetic neurosis about his hair. So. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, it really is a, uh, a very rare and lovely opportunity to have uh, a chance to address this class uh, one more time. But at the same time, in all honesty, it's also a complete pain in the neck. <laughs> because really, what is there left to say? I have been talking to these people for years. What is left for me to say? Or if there is something left to say, what could I say tonight that's going to make the difference? Uh, that is not, however, uniquely my problem. The guy who has a really tough job is Dennis Kozlowski, who has to do this tomorrow. But at this time of the year, he's not alone either. In fact, uh, thousands of speakers are addressing graduating classes, and every one of them is struggling to find something worthy, something meaningful to say. And generally, they do a good job. There is some very valuable stuff that gets thrown around at this time of the year. And it's interesting what they talk about and what they don't talk about. What they don't talk about is another academic lesson. No one really gets up here and teaches a new math theorem, another history or grammar lesson, another French verb tense. And if you don't know the Krebs cycle by now, there's nothing we can do for you. And if they do talk about these things, if they mention them, God forbid, it is actually just to draw a greater lesson from them. Because graduation time speakers talk about life lessons, about wisdom. And it is almost as if it is because we're afraid that has been missing from our curriculum. And I suppose in some sense that's largely true. Uh, what wisdom we do manage to teach in the classroom uh, is secondary <coughs> and indirect. And that's not exactly our fault or the fault of the educational system, uh, it actually has something to do with Western culture. What we value as knowledge in the West is the fact. What is directly useful, what is practical, what is quantifiable. Knowledge is power, Bacon said, and power is command of facts and data. And the fact has been the undisputable fuel of Western achievement for 500 years. We have been, though, somewhat weaker in wisdom in the West. Generally, the closest thing that we come to wisdom, we refer to as common sense. And that, at least in my case, is usually used in the negative as if to say, you don't have it. Why don't you have any common sense? Or uh, to remember one of the uh, phrases that sort of swims around in my head from my childhood, uh, my mother, who uh, loved to say to me, how can a boy who's so smart be so dumb? It's really a very good question. And at least I did have enough common sense never to answer her when she asked me that. But that's what I'm here to talk and share with you tonight is the relationship between the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Here, these people sit, a 12-year career finished. They have been amassing knowledge. And we will top it off with a few comments on living a good life, which vaguely seems to suggest that knowledge isn't enough. And all of us, in fact, sitting here, parents and teachers, worry that really it isn't. You may be smart, but do you have a good head on your shoulders? Have you developed the life skills to handle success, to recover from failure? Are you a strong person? Do you have a good character and a good heart? Who teaches that? How do you teach that? And how do you learn it? Well, I stumbled onto this a little bit this winter when I offered a first time elective in philosophy and the humanities. Uh, in truth, I didn't know where it was going. I didn't know how difficult it would be. And actually, I offered it because I had never read most of the stuff and I wanted to and have a chance to talk to people about it. I also thought that this group would be particularly interested in it. There were a lot of people with kind of a philosophical turn of mind. And in fact, 12 seniors took me up on the off offer, and they met every author and idea with great enthusiasm and serious contemplation. It was a marvelous and exhilarating exchange from beginning to end. Uh, we began with Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. And our first serious question, in fact, considered the relationship between wisdom and knowledge. 
The class then proceeded to read through Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Jesus and Paul, the Tao, Descartes, Rousseau, Wollstonecraft, Marx, Nietzsche, Freud, and Sartre. And for their last paper, I asked them to relate three of the authors or the books or ideas which they had found the most meaningful. And I'd like to share with you parts of those papers tonight. Rather, you see, than impart our wisdom to them, I would like to turn the tables and share some of their wisdom with you. And I would like to do this because I think it confirms what I hope, actually I suspect you already know, but should be reminded of. How mature, how serious, how clear-headed, how wonderful, and how brave your children are. So let me read selections from those papers. They will be anonymous. I will do very little editing. They will be somewhat rough, possibly out of context, perhaps jarring. You may disagree with what you hear at times, but let all of that go and just listen. First, the question. There is a vast universe in which we live, a universe filled with cause and effect, a universe that is a metaphor for all it encompasses. We are small parts of an enormous whole that essentially does not recognize us as being. On a smaller, more intimate scale, we are the whole that more often than not does not recognize its own being. So how then can we come to recognize ourself as existence, as being, and as essence? Another student put it this way. You will witness the world change around you. You will see your foes, friends, family, acquaintances rise and plummet, ignorance sent to enlightenment and back again. You will see their minds change. You will learn from their mistakes. You will hide your heart and expose your true self with all the mountains of your strength and all the crevices of your weakness. You will watch your body change from soft and supple baby fat to a gangling adolescent to a sturdy middle-aged body to creases and wrinkles that will envelop your skin. You will check yourself each minute and with each loss, each victory and in every situation. You have one brain and two eyes, but how do you use them correctly? How do you express what is in your head and in your heart? Language is oftentimes futile, and every action can be interpreted differently through each pair of eyes. So what are we supposed to do? Someone wrote, to simply exist in this world takes the minimal effort of filling your stomach and keeping yourself warm and dry. But to live in this world takes eternal self-examination and constant adjustment to the transitory world that we exist in. So a theme seemed to be self-examination. And someone wrote, life without reflection is doomed to be static, with no notion of self-improvement, self-esteem, truth, honesty, or vision of the world around you. When you fail to examine your own life, you fail to examine life in all of its facets. You may witness happenings and events, but you are forever destined to play a passive role in all of these situations until you can see the world through your own eyes and act in accordance to your own will. Someone put it a bit more practically. One must have focus and concentration on what it is one wants to achieve, discipline to stay with the process of reaching the goal, and patience to let the rewards of focus and discipline come. Once the self is fully understood, only then can a person be at complete peace within themselves and the outer world. Taking responsibility for the self is the beginning of understanding and fulfilling one's purpose. Too often, people spend all of their time worrying about other people's actions or thoughts or getting to know everyone in their surroundings, yet the whole time they don't even know who they truly are. I think that before we can solve any problem, we must be at ease with ourselves, and before we can truly understand anything or anyone else, we must understand ourselves. So responsibility for the self is the beginning of understanding. We deny our freedoms, but we cannot negate them. We deny our responsibility by hiding ourselves in institutions or in blaming others for what is our fault. You are totally responsible for everything you do, but in this you are also responsible for your positive contributions and successes. The individual alone has the power to establish his or her identity to create her own essence. We define ourselves in every decision we make, every action, achievement, or failure, not just by our intentions. And someone put it perhaps more personally, she can choose anything, but she must realize what the consequences will be. 
When she takes this responsibility, she does so for all of humankind. What she chooses is what she would want for everyone. This implies that we are all capable of drastically changing this world. And if you take responsibility for yourself, it seems you discover a wider connection. Humans are alive and part of being. Humans are not obliged to treat others equally, but in turn they will be missing the great contentment that is possible in life. And in a similar vein, people must always accept the consequences of their various choices and therefore cannot simply abuse others for their own benefit. <clears throat> to become strong, one must yield. Humans must be willing to give up part of themselves in order to find happiness. The spirit of unity will create both inner and outer peace. And here we have the beginning of wisdom. The lessons can easily be put to everyday use. Treat everyone well, welcome failure, do not be too confident, and look at other people's lives as if they were your own. By simplicity, it is meant that life should be lived day by day and by clear and moral rules. We preoccupy ourselves with busyness in our culture. We never take time to listen and hear the om. We lose ourselves in the way of life. This happens through temptation, routine, and occupying our time on earth with work, television, or other diversions. Most of us never realize the unity that exists between ourselves and everything around us. Most seek knowledge, but never know wisdom. We want jobs with high pay and sexy prospects. And if we succeed in our pursuit of these, the determination in our quest and the glory in our achievement distract us from the ohm, deafening our soul so that we do not know when we are being summoned. And finally, someone told us we are indeed being summoned. Finding yourself, or at least the path towards yourself, is the message that the universe whispers with every moment. The path runs from the outskirts to the center of the universe that you are. Follow your path, life is enlightenment. So to conclude, to parents and to my colleagues and to everyone in this room and beyond who has been invested in this moment and in this celebration, we have done our part. And to the class of 1997, my friends, let me summarize. Be aware. Listen, think, feel, bend, laugh, learn, and as you have so marvelously done through your example, continue to teach. Thank you.
Days of our lives. Act one, final scene. A bittersweet farewell. Cast in the roles of two high school seniors are Abby Rose as herself and Sarah McMe as Sarah Parkinson. <laughs> Sarah has paranoid delusions. So, we're graduating. <coughs> What's wrong? I'm scared. Why? Everything's changing. It feels weird. <coughs> Everything's changing. It does feel weird. <laughs> the last day of classes brings on sudden near catatonic behavior due to inability to accept the approaching departure. <laughs> the next day, Sarah and Abby reminisce. Buggin, I can't believe I'm actually going to miss all those stupid everyday things. Oh my god, like my mushroom mug from the Clinton Cafe? And how it always rains on picture day. Oh my god, my hair always looks so bad. <laughs> and the scary shadows at night and fog? <sighs> and gossip is way essential, even if it's about us. Hey, remember those guys in tight jeans in the musical? <laughs> <laughs> And the way immature conversations on van rides to games. Yeah, and the wrath of Mr. Hutton when you don't have one of those sticker things. <laughs> Sarah and Abby discuss the astounding competence of their educational institution's faculty. Abigail, I will miss my teacher so much. I know what you mean. Mr. Gilmore is so funny in assembly. <laughs> And Mr. Dills has amazing insight into the true meanings of symbols in our reading. <laughs> and Mr. Hawks and Mr. Fletcher were so sweet to teach us how to bowl. And remember how Miss McManus helped me out when I was stressing over the decision between Harvard and Yale? And those poetry bombs and Mr. Sherman's were so <laughs> sneaky. <laughs> oh, and remember the chocolate mousse? Madame Clinton is so saintly for cooking us a French dinner. And Mrs. Davies like my own mommy. Oh. Gee, we had the best teachers. Act two, scene one, real life begins. Sarah and Abby, AKA Muffy and Buffy, discuss the future. Well, old chap, would you like to join me in a cup of tea? Why, yes, smashing. So, what will you do now, old chum? Well, Muffy, I'm off to the links for a round of golf. No, no, I mean in the future. Oh, well, I'm off to Oxford, but I'll miss you terribly, old chap. Ah, uh, yes, I'll miss all the good old times. I'm ready to leave, but I'm not ready to part with everyone I've befriended here. I've had such a marvelous time, darling. Well, we'll always be friends. Have your people call my people. We'll do brunch. <laughs> Conclusion. Seriously now, folks, all this makes leaving Berwick really hard. We have learned so much here, and not just academically. We've learned to make friends. We've learned to make enemies. We've learned to love boys. I've learned to hate boys. <laughs> and we have learned that life can be hard, yet strangely satisfying. <laughs> the fact that things are changing reminds me of a quote in Mr. Sherbon's room. Life is like an onion. So graduating. You peel it off one layer at a time. What happens now? And sometimes you weep. The end.
good evening. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Michael Marigi. And I'm Ryan Wong. Um, when anyone looks at Ryan and I, you basically say, okay, these guys have absolutely nothing in common, but sorry, you're wrong. Um, we've both been at Burke for 12 years, and uh, we really don't have that much time right now, but we're gonna try to catch a few points, um, big changes which have happened the past 12 years since we've been here. There's a term often uh, people use to describe people like Mike and I who have been here for so long. Losers. Uh, <laughs> Well, not that one. Uh, I was thinking uh, lifers would probably be uh, more socially acceptable. Yeah, well, um, we've been here for a very, very long time, and uh, when we first came here, th this art center was just being built, and I'm sure there's people here who think this place has been here forever, but no, it hasn't either, but sorry. It was being built when we came. Um, for some of you who are still unclear of how long we've actually been at Berwick, um, I'd like to put that in perspective. Uh, Berwick has been a part of our entire life, all except for six years. <laughs> um, but Berwick has this crazy thing. They want it to be really hard to be a lifer now, so they keep adding grades. <laughs> <laughs> There's this thing called a kindergarten now. It wasn't here when we first came here, but now it's, it's 13 years to be a lifer, so. Ah, uh, jeekas, as if 12 years wasn't enough already. <laughs> but uh, not, uh, not mentioning the kindergarten, there have been other changes too. Um, I've seen many of my classmates come and go. Um, I've seen many of my teachers come and go. Um, and even the headmaster. <laughs> yes, we do have more tenure than he does. <laughs> Also, uh, one of the first things that uh, changed besides the building of the art center was uh, the building of the lower school, which when first built, it was also a lower and middle school. It was like lower schools downstairs, middle schools upstairs. And before it was a lower school, middle school, or lower school like it is right now, it was a bunch of trees. <laughs> um, there used to be a building called the Von Eastman. Um, it was mostly for lower school classes and later it changed to uh, be a language center. That was, I'll never forget that building because that was the first time I bumped into Mr. Downey. <laughs> um, I shut the door without holding it with Scott Boldebook, an old classmate of mine, and uh, I was taught some manners. But, um, <laughs> but now it's, it's torn down now and, uh, <laughs> and uh, we have the big new middle school. And uh, for those of you who don't notice, there's a new gym sitting over there, about three courts, field house, big nice game court, Primo, they just built that uh, recently, they just finished it in November, I think. It's big, and like, you know the old expression, if someone wants to make fun of you saying, okay, you couldn't hit the broad side of a barn, if you say you can't hit the broad side of a field house, you really can't shoot at all. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure many of you have uh, received many letters o over the summer and uh, you know they're talking about countless renovations of fog. Uh, a lot of stuff went on in fog and I was here to witness all of it. Uh, one of the biggest changes was uh, the small library that used to be, that is now the faculty lounge. Um, it now occupies the entire upper floor of fog. It's a lot better now. Um, but over these past 12 years, uh, there's a lot which we have, uh, you know, become thankful for. Uh, basically, the school itself, uh, it's given us an excellent place to learn, um, great community uh, as far as that's concerned. Um, Borough has offered us almost a second family with this tightly, tight, com tight closely knit community. There you go. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, a home away from home for us. Also, uh, we'd like to thank the teachers, all these people sitting in black here, probably as hot as the rest of us. Um, you don't get to wear the hats, though. Uh, basically, for imparting your knowledge on us, that's a big thing, thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, some of the teachers were uh, genera generous enough uh, to let us out of class early from time to time. I was, that really, I was really thankful for that. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I, I think another big thing is, um, is you know, you, you take these spot reading quizzes from time to time, and from time to time you don't do your reading. From time to time you do really bad on these spot reading quizzes. And from time to time the teachers are nice enough to drop the lowest quiz grade. <laughs> Some of them anyway. <laughs> But of course, their main goal was uh, to work us hard and push us to our limits, which they have done a pretty good job. Oh yeah. Um, and finally, all the people in blue back here, thanks a lot, great friends. Uh, you guys are great. It was just wonderful sharing this experience with you in the past year, some of you quite a bit longer. Each of you in this class of 1997 has really made a great impact on both Mike and I. For our 12 years here, I can say that this is our best year, and each one of you have contributed in a special way, in your own special way, to make it uh, more special and a better uh, class for Mike and I. Uh, we just want to take this time to congratulate you guys, and we wish you the best of luck, uh, whatever you do and wherever you go next year. Um, and now, uh, since we've been here for 12 years, uh, Unless we're going to do a PG year, they're kicking us out. Um, so it's time for us to move on, college, all that good stuff. Um, originally, when I was finishing writing this about 4 o'clock this afternoon, after staying up at prom and getting about zero sleep last night, um, I had this idea that I was going to say goodbye. And then I realized that at the senior dinner, I don't like saying goodbye just as much as ma. And uh, so in my usual way, See you later. Thanks a lot. Thank you.